morning. If you haven't got your Bibles open to 1 Peter 3, get them open to 1 Peter 3. We are going to be continuing all the way through January our series through the letter of 1 Peter, studying this letter together. Now, it is the last day of 2017 and a new year is upon us. And typically what happens uh, you know, around this time period is that speakers will give messages that seek to pump people up for the new year and to make New Year's resolutions and things like that. But what I want to do this morning is I want to prepare you for something that every single one of us in this room is going to experience, something that every single one of us is going to go through in 2018. And that is I want to prepare you for suffering. Every single person in this room, to greater or a lesser degree, will experience suffering in the new year. And what I want to look at from this passage is firstly, I want to look at the sources of our suffering. Then I want to look at the solution to our suffering. And finally, I want to see how we can uh, apply that solution to our lives. So we're going to look at the sources of our suffering, the solution to our suffering, and how we can apply that solution to our lives. So first, let's look at the sources of our suffering. Why do we suffer as people? Well, the first reason that we suffer as people is because we sin. And when we sin, sin brings a consequence. And consequences often bring pain into our lives. You see, God has set up the world in such a way that you reap what you sow. So if you sin, what will come into your life will be negative consequences. And the result of that negative consequences will typically be pain and suffering. There might be some people who are suffering today And the reason you are suffering is because of the sinful choices that you have made. The second reason why we suffer is that we suffer because we live in a sinful world. We live in a world that is broken by sin, where things don't work right. We live in a world where our cells in our bodies can rage out of control and people can get all types of different illnesses. We live in a world where there are natural disasters. A few years ago, I was speaking to a friend of mine at seminary. He was from India. And friends of his, on Christmas Day 2004, they were holidaying on the coast of India. And uh, their kids asked them if they could go down the beach. They went down the beach. And that day a tsunami hit and swept their kids away. You know, you might be suffering today. And it's not a result of your sin. It's just a result of living in a broken world, living in a fallen world. So we suffer because we sin. We suffer because we live in a sinful world. Thirdly, we suffer because of the sin of other people. And I think this is the hardest one to sort of deal with, isn't it? It's the the most painful. We could sort of get that we suffer because of our own sin and because we live in a sinful world. But when other people sin against us and they wound us, it can be extremely painful. And there might be people here today And you've carried a wound in your spirit, a wound in your soul for a long time because someone else has sinned against you and it's caused this pain in your heart. Well, Peter mentions a form of this type of suffering in verse 17, a particular form of this type of suffering that Christians endure. Look down in verse 17. He says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. He's speaking here in 1 Peter of a particular type of suffering that's in this category of suffering that Christians experience as they stand up for the name of Christ. Now, you'll remember that the letter of 1 Peter is written to Christians in the first century who were just about to experience a wave of persecution. Uh, Nero had become the emperor in Rome, and Nero was this crazy guy he burnt down part of Rome because he, he wanted to rebuild Rome and he needed a scapegoat to blame, so he blamed Christians. And so Christianity became outlawed and Christians became you know, torches for the banquets. They would dip Christians in tar, they would set them alight and they would use them as torches in banquets. Christians became food for the lions. Christians' property were being taken and this wave of persecution that had begun in Rome was about to sweep over the rest of the Roman Empire. And so Peter writes to these Christians in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, to prepare them for the suffering that they were going to experience. 
And in this paragraph, Peter has already said, a paragraph that began in verse 8, he's already said that we should not repay insult for insult. He says in verse 14 that if we do suffer for righteousness sake, we should consider ourselves blessed. He says we should always set aside Christ as Lord in our hearts and be ready to give a defense for the hope that we have. You know, everyone suffers from their own sin and everyone suffers from living in a sinful world. But there is a suffering that certain Christians experience because they are willing to be named for the name of Christ. They are willing to stand up for Christ. And if you're willing to stand up for Christ, then you will encounter suffering. You will encounter opposition. And I was just reading this week about a man in Pakistan. Pakistan is a Muslim country, has about 1.5% Christians. And this man in Pakistan, he, wanted, he was involved in the government and he wanted to bring about religious freedom and he was killed. He was suffering for doing good, for standing up for his convictions. And I think this is a type of suffering that we are going to experience more as we move forward. You know, it used to be that the culture in the church and the culture in our society were going in the same direction, but now the cultural tide has shifted. And so if, you, if you're willing, if you, if you are the sort of Christian who stands up for your faith, then you will experience ostracism, you will experience criticism, you may experience suffering as you seek unjust suffering as you seek to stand up for the name of Christ. So how do we overcome in a world of suffering? The sources of our suffering is we suffer because of our sin. We suffer because we live in a sinful world. We suffer because others sin against us, particularly as Christians. We will suffer if we name the name of Christ and we stand up for Christ. We can expect suffering. So how do we overcome? Well, what Peter does in this passage is from verses 18 to verse 22, is he holds up for us the suffering of Christ. And he says, the solution to our suffering is the suffering of Jesus. The solution to our suffering is actually the suffering of Christ. Let me explain this. Firstly, I said that we suffer because of our own sin. Well, Christ's suffering pays for our sin. Look down in verse 18 in your Bibles. Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for what? Once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Christ suffered on the cross for our sins, to take away the guilt of our sins, to pay the debt for our sins. And so when we suffer because we sin, what we need to do in that moment is we need to come back to God and we need to confess our sin to him. We also need to confess to whoever we've sinned against and we need to make restitution for our sins, for the people we've sinned against. And typically what you'll find is once you come back to God and confess your sin and you've confessed to those others that you've hurt by your sin, you'll find that the consequence for that sin dries up and usually the suffering goes away. Now I know there are some times where the sin that you commit is so large that it may have lifelong consequences. I know that's true. But even in that situation, the biggest consequence for our sin is that sin brings separation in our relationship with God. And so if you go back to God and confess your sin to Him, you will be restored in your fellowship with God. You'll have joy and peace that will enable you to travel through the difficulty of dealing with the consequences of your sin. Now at Subi, there was a man, and his name was uh, Bernard St. James. And he came, he had a really checkered past. He was involved in organized crime. He was a, a drug addict. And at Subiaco Church, we used to have this uh, program that helped people get off drugs. And he went through the program, and he was radically changed. I mean, radically delivered. But he realized once he became a Christian that he had done all this stuff that was wrong. It was criminal behavior. And he needed to pay for it. In fact, the arresting officer was actually Damien Aland here. <laughs> he actually arrested Bernard and, and uh, Bernard had to go to jail and pay for his crimes. But now he had Christ with him. He had a relationship with Jesus, which enabled him to deal with those consequences and gave him a joy 
and a peace in the midst of that situation. You know, I think it's appropriate to ask yourself in 2018, if you suffer, is to ask yourself, is this suffering a result of my sinful choice? You know, God often uses, allows us to reap the consequences of our sin so that we will be disciplined by him and so we'll come back to him. I was reading a book a few years ago by an American football coach named Tony Dungy. And Tony Dungy has a son who has this medical condition where if he touches, like, he doesn't feel pain. So if he touches like a hot plate and he burns and his fingers are burning, he doesn't feel it. And so he'll just keep his hand on the hot plate because he doesn't feel pain. Now, it, it would seem like a real blessing to be insulated against pain. But actually, pain is actually God's way of actually getting our attention. Often, God allows us to reap the consequences of our sin to discipline us so that we will run back to him confessing our sins, turning back to him as our Lord and our Master. So Christ's suffering helps us deal with our suffering, but it not only helps us deal with the suffering that comes into our life because of our sin, it also helps us deal with the suffering that we experience because we live in a sinful world. Notice what Peter goes on to say in verse 18. Look down your Bibles. He says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. The purpose of Christ's suffering was so that we would have eternal life, was so, so that we would escape this world of sin and suffering and live forever with him. And so the hope that you can have in the midst of your pain and your suffering is if you turn to Christ, you can have a hope that can help you deal with whatever pain, whatever suffering you are going through. You can have the hope of eternal life if you turn to Christ. Christ's suffering enables you to have this hope that whatever you deal with here is nothing in comparison to what awaits you when you go to be with Him. And also God has a purpose he has a purpose behind that suffering that we experience. You know, I was reading this quote by Charles Price this week. It really spoke to me. He said this, listen to this. You can never be too poor for God, but you can be too rich. You can never be too weak for God, but you can be too strong. You can never be too needy for God, but you can be too self-sufficient. You know, I read years ago that the people who God uses are ones who are emptied of themselves and therefore allow God to fill them. And the instrument that God uses to get us to realize how weak we are, how much we are poor and we need His riches, the instrument that He uses to make us realize how much we need him is suffering you know this uh, past week one of the things that i love to do uh, over this time you know you have a bit of time off is one of the things that i love to do is i love to read christian biographies i would suggest to all of you if you want to be inspired read the great lives of the christians of the past this past week i was reading about john hyde a missionary to india he was born in 1978 he died in, uh, he's born in, yeah, 1878. He died in 1912. He only died at the age of 46, which seems too young now that I am my age. Um, but uh, but uh, John Hyde was known as Praying Hyde. He was known as Praying Hyde because he would spend all night in prayer. He would pray and ask God for revival for his nation. He, he, would, he would spend just hours on his knees. He'd come into meetings like this. He'd be praying down the front. People would say, John, it's time to speak. He would stay praying until he felt God had given him a message for the people. And he, 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 said, he said one year, he said, Lord, I want greater fruit in my ministry, Lord. Can you give me greater fruit? And then after that, he had seven months of suffering, seven months on his back laid waste with sickness but he said it was God's way of actually teaching him patience God's way of getting him to wait God's way of getting him to realize not my will but thy will be done 
You see, God uses suffering in order to break down the self-life so that we will be emptied of our self, so that we will actually look to Him, so that He will fill us. The people who are mighty in God are mighty in God because they are weak in themselves and they look to Him to be their strength. The tool that God uses will be suffering. He often uses that just to break apart our pride so that we will depend upon Him and look to Him to be our only strength. So Christ's suffering is the solution to our suffering. The suffering that comes into our life because of our sin. The suffering that comes into our life because we live in a sinful world. But it's also the solution to the suffering that we experience as Christians. The opposition that we experience as people sin against us. And the reason this is, is because I want to ask you a question. What ultimately, or who ultimately, is behind the opposition that we experience as believers? Who ultimately is our enemy? Well, obviously, obviously the Bible says that people are responsible for their choices, for their sinful choices. But the Apostle Paul would say this. He would say, you do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark age. The Bible would say that the whole of this world is in the grip of the enemy, that he is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And if you stand up to be a Christian, you can expect to be a target of the enemy. You can expect that. But what we see in this passage is even though this passage has been labeled by commentators as one of the most difficult passages in the Bible to understand, what we see in this passage is one of the most triumphant passages that speaks about the victory of Jesus Christ. Look at, look at it with me. Look down in verse 18. We read, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. That is, on the cross, his body died. But, Peter says, made alive in the spirit. Even though his body died and went down into the grave, Jesus' spirit was still alive. As Jesus said on the cross, Father, into your hands, into your hands, I now commit my spirit. Now, this is fascinating. You'll find this fascinating. Is that Peter then pulls back the curtain and he shows us what Jesus did between that Friday when he died and the Sunday of his resurrection. Between that Friday when Jesus died and his body was in the grave, but his spirit was alive, and the Sunday of his resurrection. This is fascinating. Look down in verse 19. We are told this, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. Verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. What did he proclaim? He proclaimed a message of victory, a message of triumph. Now, who are these spirits in prison? Well, some people say that what Jesus did here is he gave people who are in hell a second chance, that he went down and he proclaimed the gospel to them. But that would go against the whole tenor of Scripture. Further, further, the word spirit in the New Testament always refers to demonic or angelic spirits. So Jesus came to these demonic spirits who are in prison and he proclaimed his victory on the cross. Now, who were these spirits? Well, look down in verse 20, we are told. Because they, these spirits in prison, formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So who were these spirits? Well, they're the ones, verse 20, that formerly did not obey. In the days of Noah. What's this all about? Well, right at the very beginning, there has been a battle going on between the forces of darkness and the forces of God. And obviously, God is sovereign over everything. He's in control of everything. But there is a battle going on. And at the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned and followed the temptation of Satan, the whole world was plunged into darkness. But God said to Satan in Genesis 3.15, 
that there would come a one and he would crush his head even though he would bruise his heel. And so Satan knows, Satan knew that there would be this deliverer who would come, there would be this Messiah who would come from the seed of the woman who would bring this great deliverance and would bring an end to his kingdom. And so all the way along in biblical history, you will see that Satan tried to stop the plan of God. And in Genesis chapter 6, in the flood, that was one such time. It says in Genesis chapter 6, when wickedness increased, that the sons of God, which is a reference to fallen angels or demons, took the daughters of men and they had the Nephilim, this race of people. And I believe it was Satan's way to try and corrupt the human race so that the Messiah could not come. But God rescued Noah, who was a righteous man, his three sons and their daughters, and eventually Jesus did come. And on the cross, Satan thought he won again a mighty victory, but it was actually the way that he was actually defeated. And Jesus comes and he proclaims to them his triumph, his triumph on the cross. And then on Sunday, he was resurrected. And then in verse 22, look at this. It says, he has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Christ has won the victory. He is the one who is reigning and ruling at the right hand of the Father. And so even though we might suffer opposition and persecution as Christians, we know that what's behind that, which is the enemy, even though we have an enemy, we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to, to back down because Christ has won the victory. Look at what Peter says over in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. This is really interesting. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion, seeking someone to devour. I'm so afraid that so many Christians get devoured by the enemy. They either get stuck in some sort of sin and temptation and they're rendered powerless, they're worldly, they have no spiritual power, they have nothing to offer anyone. All Christians become afraid because of the cultural climate and therefore back down and back away from their witness rather than stepping up and being counted for Christ. Look at what he says in verse 9. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. All around the world. Maybe even this very day, there are Christians who are suffering for the sake of Christ. Christians in the Middle East who, because they stand for Jesus, are being killed. Christians who are being treated horribly because they stand for Christ. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And don't respond to any suffering, unjust suffering that you experience with bitterness. We don't need to respond that way. You can, as Peter says, bless those who persecute you. You can set aside Christ as Lord in your heart and be ready to give a defense for the hope you have. You can do all of that because Christ is victorious. Because through his suffering, he won a mighty victory over the enemy of your souls. So what is the solution to our suffering? It is the suffering of Christ. So how do you appropriate that in your life? Maybe there are people here today, listen to me, and you are suffering, and the reason you are suffering is it's because of your own sin. You are grieving the Holy Spirit. But God has made a way through His Son for that to be confessed and cleansed and for you to walk with Him fellowship with him and joy and peace maybe there's some people here today and you're suffering just because of life in a fallen world God wants you to know that, that that's okay you have the assurance of eternal life because Christ suffered on the cross you can have a hope that will help you persevere through that and maybe there's some of you here today and you have family and friends who've turned their back on you because you become a Christian or they ridicule you because you're a Christian don't back down do not back down. 
never ever back down. Christ is at the right hand of the Father. And since Christ is at the right hand of the Father, as we sung today, no tongue can bid me hence depart. I am accepted by the only one who matters, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's now reigning and ruling this present moment at the right hand of the Father, so I can be his witness in 2018, no matter what may come. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray together.